Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the last panel of this year's Elevate Festival. A warm welcome also goes out to our listeners at Radio Helsinki and to our viewers at home. My name is Nina Schneider and I look forward to guide you through this conversation today. Let me briefly introduce myself. I represent Factor D, which is a hub for democracy in the German-speaking uh, area, and uh, we facilitate strategic collaboration between democratic actors. Additionally, I am the editor-in-chief of Relevant News, which is a platform for solutions journalism. Today's event is part of New Perspectives, uh, which is a project by Reimagining Europe, by the, funded by the European Union. Our panelists today will explore the multifaceted nature of right-wing populism and its implications for democratic societies. Allow me to introduce our panelists. Online joining us is uh, Shani Granat. She is one of the leaders uh, of the protests uh, to protect Israeli democracy and oppose government reforms. She is leading the New York activity, which is, by the way, I didn't know that, uh, the largest Israeli population outside of Israel, and previously served as deputy director of the Darkenu movement. And she also worked with former Israeli opposition leader Shelly Yechimovich. Next to her is uh, David Broder, a historian focusing on modern Italy, known for his books exploring contemporary far-right movements such, and, uh, such as Mussolini's grandchildren and First Day to Rome. Also, he is the Europe editor of Jacobin magazine and his writing appeared in renowned media outlets. I don't want to name them all, <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, welcome. And also here we have Paula Diel. You are a professor for political theory, history of ideas and political culture and uh, the director of the International Populism Research Network at the University of Kiel. And also leading the Normalizing the Far Right project at the Center of Interdisciplinary Research in Bielefeld. Welcome. Thank you. So, in today's keynote, <laughs> in today's keynote, Shalini Randeria outlined the soft authoritarian regimes globally as a new construct and uh, talked about backward-looking utopia. Paula Deal. In your research of normalization of the far-right ideologies within democratic societies, what factors contribute to making anti-democratic ed <laughs> ideas, attitudes and practices socially acceptable? Well, it's a very complicated situation and we can, we can um, observe that there is a problem on um, representation in democracy. So since the 2000s, more or less, we have, we have been spoken of um, a crisis of democratic representation. So people don't feel represented by mainstream parties mm. anymore. And this open, opens the floor for other types of answer, including non-democratic answers to this crisis of democracy. And we have observed that a part of these answers are coming with populism, so that you have a mixture of uh, right-wing extremist ideas and populism, facilitating the take-up of these ideas by democratic public sphere. Mm. So there is a kind of intricate situation. On the one hand, you have a need for more democratization, which has been used by far-right parties in order to have a, a kind of link to their policies and to their ideologies. On the other hand, you have populism facilitating the transfer of right-wing extremist ideas, which normally was outside of democratic public sphere, because we have principles um, 
in democracy which do, do not accept this kind of ideas. But when they mix with populism, giving birth of a, to, to the right-wing populism movements and parties, then they can navi navigate more easily mm. through a democratic public sphere. And that's what leads in the um, middle term to a kind of normalization. So we take up on this idea, first we get used to them, um, and then after that we don't really necessarily realize that we are taking them for granted, and then they come to the position, or they can come to the position, to change our norms, what is good and what is bad for democracy. Thank you so much. So just to clarify terms shortly, that's uh, really uh, important to me, is uh, what is the distinction, can you shortly explain, between right-wing politics, right-wing populism and right-wing extremism? I think the distinction has become very blurred um, between uh, right-wing populism and right-wing extremism. Um, what we have at the beginning is, if you take populism as a kind of um, narrative or a kind of communication or organization of political movements and parties, you can see there is a major narrative, which is the narrative of the betrayed people. So populism presents a situation of a crisis, promising to bring back democracy, promising to bring back the power to the people, mm. popular sovereignty, right? And for that, there, there is a kind of narrative explaining that the, these people have been betrayed by the elites, which are now using power and political institutions to their own profit, neglecting the representation of the people. So the, the answer of populism is to give a happy end to the situation and to give you democracy back. This is the populist narrative. When right-wing extremists take on this narrative, they add something to it, mm -hmm. which is, well, the elites are betraying the people by letting the strangers uh, contaminate the body of a people. So we need to fight against the elites because they are threatening uh, our people in their purity. So let's go back and take back the power to the people, but at the same time purifying this kind of body. Now, the both narratives, the right-wing populist narrative and the populist narrative, can be more or less, um, it's a kind of, of degree. So you can have a very strong right-wing sense on that, and you can take up in a very, uh, very light way. And that's a kind of degree that you see that um, the right-wing um, ideas, right-wing extremist ideas, which are now becoming more and more normalized, can be more and more radicalized in this process. So you have a kind of shifting. And this shifting is something that uh, we have to pay attention to. Thank you. David Broder. In your book, um, Mussolini's Grandchildren, uh, you suggest that Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni and her associates have unmistakable, unmistakably te fascist tendencies. How afraid should Europe be of Giorgia Meloni? And in your view, what factors have contributed to the rise of far-right movements in Italy? And what threats do they oppose to democratic societies? Calling my book Mussolini's Grandchildren, I didn't intend to pay a compliment to the current Italian Prime Minister. Still, I'm not saying that it's a return of fascism as it was in 1945. Rather, I'm talking about a genealogi genealogical evolution of a historically neo-fascist party, which is now normalized. Milani is obviously normalized in the international conservative movement. But this also isn't just something that's happening now or since her election, but something that's been going on for three decades. Broadly, we can say, after the end of the Cold War, after the end of the old mass parties, Italy has this volatility, uh, the breaking down of the old political system built by the resistance parties. Uh, Berlusconi brought into government far-right forces, and now within the center-right coalition, so-called, that he created, the most radical elements are dominant, the ones who have a fascist tradition. 
This isn't because Italy is strange or colorful or chaotic, but it's a process that we're starting to see also in other countries. Of course, even here in Austria, the rise of the far right is not new, or far right hegemony within the right wing space. I think in the European elections, uh, it's quite likely that we'll see some sort of formalization of the good relations that already exist between the Christian Democrats and then further right wing forces, Meloni's group, uh, people like uh, parties like Vox in Spain which already has an agreement with the traditional conservative party there. Uh, we look at countries like Sweden and Finland as well. We also have these far-right parties that are now allied to what was the kind of moderate center-right. Um, so I think over the last decade or so, we've kind of often heard this story of social democrat parties let down their working class base, so they turn to the far-right. I think that the story is a bit more complicated than that, um, also because it's part of a general crisis of democracy, as you mentioned, and also, of course, very low electoral turnouts we're seeing now. But I think what we're really seeing in this present moment is the decline of the sort of moderate centre-right traditional parties. So, is that a threat to Europe? Well, it depends which Europeans you mean. Is it a threat to Ursula von der Leyen? I don't think so. She's welcomed Milani into the mainstream, you know, going on missions to coordinate immigration policy together with third countries, authoritarian regimes in North Africa. Uh, people like the leaders of the European People's Party, Manfred Weber and so on, you know, they're welcoming this. Um, but they're trying to set some sort of red lines. They're trying to set conditions on which the far right can be incorporated into the institutional mainstream. Many of those red lines have to do with things like, well, of course, you know, is the far right, is Milani, is even someone like Marine Le Pen going to leave the Eurozone? I don't think so. Um, are they committed to NATO? Perhaps that's more of a dividing line between, say, Milani and parties like Alternative for Deutschland or the French far right. So I think we should see what's happening not as, you know, Milani is going to cause chaos, or Italy is going to split from Europe, or this kind of thing. What instead we're seeing is that ideas that were once limited to the far right, in particular around identity, policing borders, the outsourcing of migration controls to uh, non-European countries, these aren't things that just happen with Milani, they're things that have accelerated over the last decade and more. Uh, so I think that there is a right-wing takeover of the European project and of the language of Europe, the idea of civilizational decline and ethnic threat, these kind of ideas are becoming more normalized. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we should see it in terms of like, uh, you know, uh, some of you may have noticed from my accent that I'm British. Um, so in British press, I'm often kind of misquoted to say like, oh yeah, I'm saying that Italy's about to leave the European Union because of this far right leadership. I think it's not like that at all. What the far right is trying to do is to shape Europe from within. I think mm -hmm. even some of the more radical parties, which haven't been in government yet, notably the Front National, Rassemblement National, they're kind of starting to learn the lessons of the Italian case. So I think, you know, of course, Italy, you know, some people like uh, CNN's Farid Zakaria say that Meloni is the new Merkel leading Europe. I think that's probably overstated. But I think the Italian example uh, can be exported and learned from also by other far-right forces. Thank you. So, Shani, Granit, given your experience uh, and involvement in the fight for democracy in Israel, what specific challenges uh, and threats to democracy do you see in Israel? And what lessons can we learn? from your experience to defend democratic values and counter extremist tendencies? Um, well, Israel had quite a year. Uh, and I think um, if, I mean, we won't go into the constitutional problems that Israel have, but um, we can really see that the fact that there is no constitution really hurts uh, the separation of power in Israel. And once we have a very populist 
leader as we have, Netanyahu is, um, that, trying, that is trying to take down the Supreme Court and to hurt this separation of powers, then democracy is really under threat. And there's nothing, there's no constitution that will um, keep it safe. And then it's only on the people. And this is why we saw millions of people protest in Israel uh, weekly for, for 40 weeks, actually, um, until October 7th. Um, and I think that we can really see that um, the fact that Netanyahu is in a very weak position, there's a, a, he's under trial right now, and he needs to give a lot to his very far-right uh, coalition members in order to keep his coalition safe. So he basically gives them everything. In a way, he sells our country to the very far-right um, uh, parties. Parties that once were illegal in Israel, right? But now he needs them, so he elevates them, and and they are his coalition. We have ministers that were um, under uh, uh, the police investigations for years because of what they're doing, and now they're ministers in the government. So the situation is really crazy, um, and the fact that he's he has to give them to keep on giving them in order to keep this coalition safe. This is what basically hurts us more than anything else. Um, of course, also, we have a very uh, uh, problematic um, representation because we have the ultra-Orthodox. Um, we have uh, very small minorities that basically controls the, the, the majority because of the structure of, of the coalition that Netanyahu built. Uh, so most of the people in Israel are not represented in the coalition, in the government. Um, it's a really kind of twisted uh, polit political situation that we're seeing. And um, while well, we see that nationalism has a lot to do with it because this government is trying to um, tell a story <laughs> where um, we see Arabs, the, the, we have 20% uh, that are Arabs in, in Israel, but now they are being uh, shown as an inner threat, like they're trying to take down Israel from within, which of course is not correct. Um, and uh, they are using this fear in order to justify the horrible way they're acting to, the, to this minority in Israel. Um, and I think the most, our kind of way to, to fight back um, was reclaiming our symbols, reclaiming the Israeli flag. Um, me as a left-wing um, uh, human rights freedom activist, I never felt very uh, associated with any flag, basically. Um, I know that in Europe it's even more than in Israel, like flags is not something that um, liberal and Democrats and so on very uh, affiliated with. But what we did, the fact that we reclaimed our flag really helped our protest movement to grow because we show that we are the patriots, we are the one who are fighting for this country's future. Um, the fact that we're singing the, the Israeli anthem every protest at the beginning, this is what starts the, the, the rally. So for many of us at the beginning, it was quite strange, but I think it was one of the most, it was probably the smartest move we've done um, because now the Israeli flag symbolizes the protest for democracy. And that's like a huge change um, from, I mean, within the Israeli community. Um, society, and I think also the fact that uh, we're pushing back on fake news. There's a very strong social media uh, work that we've been doing. Uh, fight back, not to stay quiet. I think before we kind of we, we thought that it's nothing too bad. It's only social media. Nothing can happen. But now we see how violent people became. I was under hundreds of thousands of threats. Um, phone calls, messages, social media, as well as, of course, all of my colleagues. So uh, I think the fact that we decided to push back very strongly, I was 
uh, one of the uh, founders of uh, Democrat TV, which is a social media channel. Um, and I think the fact that we were, we're we stopped kind of keep on quiet to this violence in social media was really mm -hmm. helping. Um, and the last thing I can say from my experience is education. I know it's like the obvious thing, but um, for a long term, I mean, we can only go out to the streets. I mean, I don't know. We managed to do it for 40 weeks. Now we're coming back, but it's, it's hard to take hundreds of thousands of people to the streets week after week in any in every weather. And for the long term, education is really, really important to put the right people in the system. Um, I think this is a very important effort that we're trying to do. And in my vision, it's probably the only thing that will make us win this, not in a year from now, but in 10 years from now. Thank you so much. Uh... And thank you for your effort. <laughs> That's uh, amazing. Uh, so I think we heard uh, a lot about the problems and uh, what is at stake and the problems we are in. Um, the big question I always ask myself is, what now? What are our chances? What can we now actually do? <laughs> so one thing I really wonder is, can we draw lessons? from far-right movements? And if so, how can we apply this knowledge and address the challenges posed by these threats, uh, by these movements? David, maybe you can elaborate on that. Mm. Well, we've talked a little about populism and the, the kind of communicational style mm -hmm. of these leaders. Of course, one can debate whether Populism is just a kind of rhetorical or communicational style or, or a way of posing political conflict, betrayed people versus elites. Um, and of course, it's true that that kind of framing of politics is hardly just the preserve of the far right or even of political extremes. Like it's obviously the case that a kind of soft version of that kind of narrative has also become quite commonplace even of sort of insurgent uh, centrist or even centre-right forces. Uh, if we think, for example, well, of, of course it, it's different, but uh, if we think of the way in which the sort of old party system uh, is often condemned, for example, if we think of like Emmanuel Macron uh, during his first run trying to uh, overcome the, uh, the previous parties, or in fact, as he put it, uh, both left uh, and right. I think that the popularity of these kind of ways of talking so kind of leader centrism, the idea of novelty, those kind of things were quite common in left-wing populist movements in the 2010s, since the financial crisis, let's say, as well. Um, the idea that while the old working class base or the popular classes or the coalition of interests that supported these left-wing and anti-fascist parties, um, they could be reunited behind sort of great leaders, surges of electoral enthusiasm, and so on. And I think what we've really seen is that didn't really work. There was, in some cases, there were initial, you know, if we look at, say, Greece with Syriza, Podemos in Spain, these kind of things. Uh, there were surges of enthusiasm, there were popular leaders, but those parties sort of failed to establish themselves as lasting forces. Uh, after the first defeats, after the first signs of trouble, uh, they actually lost their support quite quickly. I think that there's, uh, I work for Jacobin magazine, which is often associated with this kind of left populist perspective. So we tend to say, you know, the important thing to defeat the far right isn't just to sort of warn what, about their threat or talk about how bad they are, but to build our own alternative. And I think doing that necessarily requires different tools from the kind of thing that Giorgio Maloney or so on go with, you know? They can appear in media, shout angrily against the powerful, but then just find a way for, for themselves within those same institutions mm. in a way to become quite a normal right-wing leader who pursues policies like cutting taxes and shutting down immigration and this kind of thing. 
the kind of politics which is my own, which is you know, left-wing and socialist politics, fundamentally relies on empowering ordinary people mm. to have more power over their own lives, and to democratize society, including things like workplaces, including things like control of housing policy in local areas. Uh, it's about pe the mass of ordinary people feeling that they have power to change things. So I think it can't rely on um, the just sort of angry rhetoric or demagogic promises of change. It's necessarily a long-term organizing process. So I think there are things we can learn from the far right in the sense of, uh, yes, point, you know, not defending the comfortable status quo or imagining that Europe as it exists must exist like this forever, that all we need to do is defend it from uh, various outside threats. But at the same time, I think for the reason I said, I think fundamentally um, the way we or my side of the political camp go about doing politics inherently relies, uh, relies on different, different tools. Right. Would you like to... Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to find, Can we find a way to, learn? To, to connect to what we are saying. Um, I think there is a huge problem behind ev everything, which is um, the problem of visions of for the future. Actually, we have a crisis of the left, which is not able to formulate and to, uh, to develop visions for the future, which can be connected to a positive idea of the future. And that's what is lacking, right? So that's the chance for right-wing nostalgia, for an idea of the past that never have been there, but Again, it's the kind of imagination of that. And one of the tools could be to reformulate what we think should be democracy. Mm -hmm. So open up the space for dialogue, open up the space for debating what democracy should be and what democracy is. Because democracy is based on this discussion, right? And I, I see um, a problem with opening the space. I think um, to take what Shani already uh, have talked about the symbols, it's imp crucially important to take back the symbols that unify everyone. I, I, it happened, I happened to be in Brazil after the last elections where um, the country are completely divided between Bolsonaro and Lula um, and the Bolsonaro party uh, was very successful in appropriating um, the symbols of the football national um, uh, a team for their own purposes during the, the World Cup, right? And um, that makes people from uh, the other um, parties uh, who are against Bolsonaro very difficult to articulate themselves. So what I saw was people wearing um, the T-shirt the of, 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 of Brazilian um, national club, but reading that's just for the cup, that's not for Bolsonaro, mm -hmm. right? So, and in and, and the same way Fandabella tried in, in Austria to recuperate the, um, uh, the, the, the term Heimat, which is a kind of home nostalgia, but also can be something that can unify everyone. So I think coming back to unifying symbols, proposing something like a space to debate, mm. uh, the very question of Hannah Arendt, uh, how do we want to leave, could be the way to come back to, democra to democratic terms. Thank you. And Shani already mentioned the reclaiming of the flags. Would you like to uh, add anything to what can we learn from far-right movements and how can we apply it? Well, I think I'll say again from, from my point of view, I think one of the things that really helped us was building a narrative that everyone could feel that it's their own narrative. Um, and it's quite hard. Israel is a very, very divided society um, after having Prime Minister Netanyahu for 15 years and the right for 40 years. Um, like, I'm 33. I literally never had a prime minister that I can uh, feel that I can trust. Um, 
So Israel is like our society is not in a in a in a good shape to mm. to go out and protest together. Mm. And I think I don't know if if people here can relate to that, but sometimes in our camp, in order to to be a part of it, you have to be like 200% like us, right? You need to be feminist, vegan, anti-occupation. Like you have to do the whole thing, right? There if and, and if you're not one of them, then you're just not part of us and we're very strict on that. Um, and I think what was very successful for us this time was that we we really worked hard to not be that way. <laughs> um, and this is how this protest movement created, like there's a women's march and there's the veterans movement and there's the anti-occupation block mm-hmm. and there's the high-tech movement. Like why would high-tech people come and protest? But the economy is at stake. So they found their own kind of path to take part in this protest and there was the grandmother's front <laughs> and was, like we had all these different um movements within the protest pro-democracy movement and a lot of the things uh we would probably fight one another within our camp but this time it was very obvious we we're fighting for democracy and we can fight for everything else after Um, but this time we're all at the same front and I think if you're creating uh, as wide front as you can as we see at least in Israel that the right wing are doing for the first time the liberal democratic camp created this wide front um, and it really really saved us like if we weren't doing this we couldn't have enough people we can see in the parliament that the left wing Jewish um, um, party is very very small it used to be the largest one in the parliament and now it's like hmm. the smallest one basically so if we would only count on if you consider yourself a left wing this is your fight we could never win this hmm. so uh, with this whole crowd of people going to the streets currently all over the world and especially uh, in Germany it was a historic mm. uh, movement uh, and still uh, the knowledge that we also heard in these last couple of days that uh, the non-voters are, are also really strongly mm. uh, one question I ask myself is how can a majority by really the majority and uh, what collaborative efforts um, or alliances uh, are there to ensure democratic representation and inclusivity? Hmm. I think there are many different levels of, uh, of the way civil society um, and media and politics can work. Uh, I think we all have a responsibility on that, um, on civil society. D- You can have uh, NGOs, uh, movements or protests that you have right now, but also intra-subjective interaction can be a a place where you can have a a kind of uh, action in order. I mean, we we all in Europe, at least, we all experience uh, people that we love that already argue um, in a right-wing extremist matter. And it's everyone's know how difficult it is to keep this relationship and to try to have a, a way to, to speak with them, right? So it, it, it's a quite difficult exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have the institutions where you are in, in the university, on your workshop, uh, in the workplace. And um, I think the one very important thing we can keep in our all-day basis interaction is to be self-reflexive, because sometimes Normalization of the far right does not necessarily involve consciousness. I keep watching myself and I realize that sometimes I'm already drifting towards some stuff from the far right, right? Because I'm used to consume that in the media and so on. So keeping self-reflexivity could be a kind of self-correction. The second one in intersubjective interaction will be to have a space where um, there is room for someone to say stop. It's important to have someone who can say stop if you are going towards a direction which is not a democratic interaction. 
right? When you have um, a norms already, a, a democratic norms being, um, uh, being pushed away. Um, and that's very important to have someone to say, okay, now you want to form. Sometimes people don't realize they are doing that. And then if you go to um, civil society's organization, you can go for NGOs, works, to uh, protesters and so on. And I'm, I'm really uh, watching what is happening in Germany. It's really, uh, it doesn't stop a mass demonstration all week, everywhere. And the interesting part of it, they are putting pressure on the parties, on the established parties, in order to react to what is happening uh, with the far right. And then you have, of course, the media, which is, in a certain way, journalists are under pressure mm. because you have um, a very strong affinity between commercialized media um, economy of, of attention economy on the one hand and the way right-wing populist argument uh, argument is about, does develop right so the communication techniques are very they really match the criteria of the media so that you everywhere actors who are adopting populism are privileged by the mass media uh, and I, it, it, you don't need to go to social media, you can go to offline media. It's still, these rules apply. So the question here is, how can you do your job as a journalist mm. or a, a creative media actor without reinforcing the right-wing extremist uh, mm. messages? So one thing is to, again, try to show um, in a self-reflexive manner what is happening, but it's very demanding for journalists because journalists now don't, it's not enough to make fact check. Mm. What they need to do is to deconstruct the, uh, 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 the strategies behind this communication. And that's quite demanding, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. Some of them do it in a very funny way. Um, so then that you can have this kind of idea that the consumers of news also need to be entertained, which is also a problem. And then, of course, for politicians, they have a responsibility, and um, I don't see the responsibility only on the institutional level, bil building coalitions, but especially in seti setting the issues and the debate on the public sphere. We have seen that mainstream uh, parties have has a tendency to copy right-wing populists in order to compete with them. And that's a very dangerous move. And again, it's not only dangerous, but it doesn't work for uh, in a medium term. So it's it, it normalized the far right so that everyone who's trying to cope with that in the end will be like the second alternative. Mm. Yeah, let us uh, stay on your second point, the media um, and the role of the media what do you think, David Broder? Is it good to provide a uh, right-wing populist with a platform and then really jump on their topics? Or how can a counter-public act? <coughs> well, I think uh, certainly in the Italian case and looking at the ownership of the Italian media landscape, uh, it's unfortunately not in our gift whether to give them a platform or not. You know, they're very well established. They have a lot of their own media. Uh, the way the spoiled system works in sort of political appointments of directors of the public broadcaster, even of artistic spaces and so on in Italy, means that the ruling party inherently has the ability to dominate airspace, and they are. Mm. Perhaps this government more than others, but it's also not new. I think for people opposed to far-right parties, uh, including as journalists. Um, I agree very much what you say about self-reflexivity. I think it's very easy to uh, get into a, a kind of game where you become kind of internal mm -hmm. to the far-right mentality and way of talking about themselves. Um, I must even say myself, uh, because you know, I have a book about Mussolini's grandchildren, which is about mil which is about the history of the far right, but can easily be made into you know, oh, you're someone who talks about Meloni. I end up just being someone who follows everything that Meloni does on the internet, comment on her every Instagram post, 
make fun of her, engage in satire, but in a way which isn't at all like politically productive. Um, so I think it's very important for, um, you know, I think it's very important to hold the government accountable, to um, uh, challenge their own self-narrative and self-celebration, challenge a lot of the indulgent accounts about Maloney's government, which are very widespread in international media. I think there's a crucial work of holding them to account, showing who they really are, showing who their friends are, showing what their agenda is. Um, but at the same time, I think that, that um, critical media or oppositional media also can't just tell this endless and depressing story of the barbarism of the people in power. It has to be part of some sort of political project, uh, which also tells other stories about the society, um, and which don't just end up sort of telling a story about how hopeless everything is. Um, I think you know, if we look at some of, you know, of course, uh, if we look at a lot of European countries or the overall European landscape, certainly the far right is on the rise. There were a couple of elections last year where the expected far right breakthrough didn't happen or where the uh, existing right wing far right forces were defeated. If we look at Poland or we look at Spain. So, you know, those in each case, if we look at the elections, the far right or right wing and far right alliance was defeated by quite broad coalition of forces. It's true, um, but uh, also included, uh, you know, not just countering the right wing narrative, uh, but also standing for a certain record of social policy, of material benefits, uh, and yeah, different groups, different parts of the electorate. But yeah, broad alliances, but which also had specific aims and agendas of their own. Mm -hmm. and I think there's a, a real problem for opposition parties or even the journalists and media who are aligned with them of becoming kind of uh, subaltern to the government agenda in the sense of kind of just reflecting to and reacting against what they say rather than maintaining their own vision. Mm -hmm. And it's very much connected to what you said before. You know, mm -hmm. what's our vision of the future? If this is the way, you know, if Europe just seems to be declining and meaner and nastier and harsher, then what's our alternative. So, of course, it isn't the job of journalists to paint the vision of the beautiful tomorrow, uh, but if we're you know, politically engaged people, and uh, then that's what we have to be doing as well, I think. Shani, would you like to add your perspective? Um, yeah, I think, first of all, in Israel, there's a, um, the, the far right is very much organized. Um, kind of like an octopus that has like their hands everywhere in a very, very organized way. Um, and I think in time we've learned that we have to do the same. Um, so they, are, they have programs of educating people in the far right um, um, education systems and then putting them with scholarships in uh, positions where they can uh, affect the media, the press, the government, like they literally have programs for each and every part of Israel, how to put uh, far right uh, people in, in strong positions. So we have to do the same. Um, and I think one of the things we've done throughout this uh, protest is that we created very strong groups that are giving language to people that are educating our camp. Um, in many ways, um, like our political camp doesn't really have a leader. Um, we don't really have strong opposition in Israel these days, or at all, basically. Um, so we don't have a leader to look up to. So it's, it's literally everything on the people, on us. Um, so creating the, the, um, the language for people to understand what they're reading about, because they, they consume media that is controlled by the right, um, and they see the news that is controlled by the right, and I mean, we have to push back and also to give our people a language to understand um, the, the reality and to fight back, to give them ammunition, 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 ammunition in, a, in a way. So um, I think this is one of the things we've learned in our protest movement and we're trying to do, and we're getting better in this. Um, and, and also we see that social media 
is very much, at least in Israel, but I think I see it here in America as well, and probably in Europe, is very much controlled by right-wing um, uh, incentives. Um, so as hard as it is, we have to be on TikTok, <laughs> even <laughs> though I hate it. Like, we have to be there because my 16-year-old niece reads everything, consumes her entire understanding of reality is from TikTok. And if we won't be there, she won't hear our voice. Um, so we can't afford not to be in those platforms. Um, and we're working very hard. And it's really, I think in many ways, not natural for many of us, um, but to create our kind of answers in these platforms. Um, I think it's crucial for our fight for democracy. Maybe I jump on that. Please. I mean, I was uh, during you were talking, Shani. I was I was thinking about two things, which makes a democratic reaction um, in social media very very hard to achieve. The first one is uh, this logic of likes and dislikes, right? You are this logic, which is medium inherent, drives us to a kind of. Um, polarize um, public opinion, right? So we, we lose the way to have a kind of open debate in order to find out what we want. That's the first one. The second one is the invective language, which is usually used in, in, in social media mm. that breaks with all rules of respect and civility. So how, how can you develop something positive to deal with these two problems that you have in social media, which is the, th the, the space where the far right has much more advantage than all democratic reactions to it. Yes, um, I totally agree. It's very hard. Um, it feels like people doesn't want to have any complex idea, like like or dislike. Mm -hmm. So it has to be very, very clear. Um, I think we are trying, as I said before, to, to get to like the common base. What are the things we all agree on and that we can get likes on, right? So most of the people in Israel believe that, uh, women, like that women are equal to men. And we show in our video, in our social media, how this government and how this judicial overhaul that they're trying to create will affect women. So it's a very, very basic layer of our fight. But this is how we get engaged with a lot of people. Um, I think once you get them to kind of engage with you and you can affect more, then you can take another step and show how it affects also other populations in Israel and how it will affect them, them and how it, I mean, it's really in a way we're trying to be very um, emotional to them to show people how um, this overhaul or this government uh, will affect the most essential things in their lives. Like they won't have um, uh, their freedoms. And it's a very, very, basic thing. Um, we're not going into the more complex ideas. We're not even trying to make anything like, don't be altruists. It's not for somebody else. It's for you. So it's a very kind of egocentric kind of um, <laughs> ideas that we're trying to push. I know it sounds bad, like as a social Democrat, I want everyone to care about everyone. Uh, but it doesn't sell as good in social media. Um, so this is what we have, and I think this is our tool to push back. Hmm. So we are coming to our last round. I called it Outlook and Recommendation for Action, which I, I happened to join several panels. Uh, they were not really fruitful. I hope... <laughs> I hope we will have some amazing ideas. So uh, let's uh, talk about resistance uh, strategies, Paula Deal. Um, do you identify resistance strategies in this normalization in politics and civil society? I mean, there are groups who are well organized, but they are not having so much media cover. That's um, 
one thing. Um, I, I know from colleagues working on feminist groups uh, um, and native um, born in, in Brazil, for example, or in, in whole Latin American against the far right, they are organ well organized, they have, have had social work, but they are not getting coverage. So maybe taken up on, on the social media strategy uh, and being egocentric could be a way to, mm -hmm. to have that. Um, on the other hand, if you look at, at Germany, I was amazed by, by these mass demonstrations and they, they show that there are um, organization of uh, civil society trying to show up themselves and the motto they, uh, they were using was we are the majority. We are not the silent majority, we are the majority. And I, th I think it's very successful. Um, and then there is this kind of um, small place interaction. I, I remember um, someone wrote to me uh, saying, look, I'm in a place in Germany, I don't know, don't want to say where, but I'm in a place in Germany, it's a small town, is over, the, the huge majority is from the, from the far right. I can even not speak with my son. Um, what can I do? And, and of course, we are as an experts, we, we, are, we cannot answer these questions, but the only thing I could do is to say, well, try to articulate what, what you see. And, and w one week later, I got an, an answer, which was amazing, I was so happy, saying, you know, I tried to do what you told me, and I wrote a letter to the uh, newspaper, who, which now has become a far-right uh, ally, and I wrote a letter complaining about the coverage, and they published. And after that, other people come up writing letters, and now they are organized. They are not so many, but they are organized. They don't feel alone anymore. And if you, th if you realize you're not alone, and that's what the far right have done in the last 20 years, it, it had connected people who feel alone, right? Mm -hmm. And now the, when the majority maybe is, is not very clear if it's the majority, it's very important to have performative acts that show that you are not alone, and to show that to the to the public sphere. I guess that's something which is crucial, right. also in order to put pressure on, on on the established parties, not all on the far right. <clears throat> I think resistance is important. Mobilizing people, being visible in public space, including in the demonstrations in Germany, right? Because it's easy to characterize as, oh, you know, Berlin or Hamburg or you know, these big cities, all the people who support the Greens and the Social Democrats and so on gather together. But it's not just that. It's even in towns in former East Germany where, like, majorities of young people support the AFD. Mm -hmm. Even there, people are putting themselves out there, perhaps even risking, you know, being noticed, being observed as one of those people who, yeah, has a problem with the AFD. Mm -hmm. I think you can't get past the fact that you, we need to confront these ideas. Uh, we can't just say, well, you know, the far right is, is this like monster that we must resist at election time, uh, or that they're importing these horrible ideas into our democracies, even at the same time as parties that call themselves social democratic or liberal and so on are themselves demonizing migrants, are spreading the idea that people are coming here to steal our jobs, that yes, we need to tighten our borders and keep more people out. Um, it doesn't work. You're, if you go along the path of dehumanizing people, saying that there are citizens A and other people B, people who count less, then you're not confronting those arguments. Mm -hmm. You're not confronting the far right. You're just offering a weaker version of the same thing. And this is why I think that strategies based on kind of trying to, and you know, I think we've seen a lot in the US recently, strategies based on trying to appeal to these kind of moderate Republicans who won't go along with Trump, they fundamentally aren't working. You have to mobilize people who are against all this. You have to mobilize a real opposition that isn't just a weaker version of the far right, because people will always vote for the original and mm -hmm. the real thing rather than the lame copy. We've seen 
in recent months and years, things like Emmanuel Macron's uh, interior minister, Gérard, uh, Gérard Damanin, accusing Marine Le Pen of being soft on Islam, accusing the far right of being incompetent or not good enough at carrying through its own agenda. I think that kind of vision of politics mm. has totally failed. And over decades, we've seen it fail time and again in Italy. Uh, I think the situation isn't hopeless, uh, but it's also, you know, I think we need to do more than just oppose the current government or oppose the far right. We need to create a politics of equality and inclusivity that is appealing to all or at least a large majority of the population. Um, so I, I think that you know, while my work is kind of focused on the kind of fascist heritage of Maloney's party and so on, I think a kind of anti-fascism that's just a negative reaction to the latest horrible thing mm. um, or an attempt to compromise or deal with it is no good. Precisely what we need to do is think about, well, you know, what does work look like? How are we going to carry through the green transition while creating jobs for millions of people, maintaining people's incomes, these kind of things? I think those kind of questions are fundamental, questions which are about people's material lives and their ability to you know, get by, have opportunities, uh, and not only a language of defending democracy or, or, or opposing these uh, authoritarian leaders. Thank you so much. We will uh, now open up and uh, there will be microphones uh, given around uh, can, if you want to add your Shani. <laughs> it was an applause, I thought. Okay, great. Yeah, you're right. Shani, I would also like to hear from you. And last week I came across an interview featuring Shrika, Shikma Pressler, a face of the Israeli democracy movement, and she, in the interview she emphasized the importance of upholding both humanity and democracy with the powerful statement, humanity must win, democracy must win. Maybe you can also add to our round, how, how can we work together as a society to build an inclusive and democratic future? Um, I think as I said, um, taking down the walls, making more gates for people to join in, to feel yeah. that it's their own fight. Um, if I had to choose one thing that is the most important thing is this. Um, I think we need to sell hope to people, um, not, not to just fight against, but also to fight for, um, to give people the vision of what we see, um, uh, I don't know, Europe or Israel or whatever, uh, the future that can be achieved. Um, and also, <laughs> I think we really need to make the right wing fight between themselves. Um, mm. So we have to be political. It's not a bad word. Uh, being political and even being populist like left-wing populism is important. It's not the only thing we can do only this, but we have to, at least where I'm living, there's no, <laughs> there's no winning without it. Um, and like, we have to be realistic. They have to, in, in, at least in Israel, in my vision, I'm working for the future, but the only way to take down this government is when they will fight between themselves. Mm. And we need to, to give them, uh, to push them into these extreme moments where they don't agree with each other within the government, within the coalition, and then they will fight, then they will break. Um, so to me, this is also part of our job, um, to work against them, to work for a better future, and to let more people in, to open our gates, not to be so hard to get. Thank you so much. Beautiful last words. <laughs> All right, back to where we were before. <laughs>
<laughs> opening up uh, the question uh, to questions in the audience. Maybe you can also add your thoughts briefly if you would like to. Um, all right, is this working? Awesome. Um, maybe bouncing back uh, or like elaborating a little bit on what you said about TikTok, because that's something I'm personally very much interested in. Um, I've been working for a human rights magazine for a considerable amount of time now, and we've recently started a TikTok channel, and we've had to face a considerable number of challenges in doing so. Um, and one of the problems that we've noticed is that these structures that are very much inherent to right-wing extremism or right-wing discourses, such as racism, um, anti-human rights movements, queerphobia, and what have you, um, are also very much ingrained in some of the platforms. If you look at TikTok, for example, you get shadow banned. That means mm -hmm. that your posts aren't as visible as others. If you include words such as human rights, anything referring to non-heteronormative identities, racism, hate, all of that stuff um, is automatically either banned or shadow banned, so made less, less visible. Um, how do we deal with these challenges, mm -hmm. with those platforms being inherently problematic for human rights discourses, for, um, say, anti-right-wing discourses? Mm -hmm. sure. um, should I answer? I don't Please. So yeah, you can add a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I would say, first of all, get find a pro democracy liberal person that works in TikTok. I'm sure there's at least one um, in your area, and learn from them how to work with this uh, platform. Um, we've learned a lot from people who work in these platforms that are volunteering and maybe kind of. <laughs> Working, working on their conscience by helping the, the human rights organizations work in these platforms. Um, so this is number one. Number two, um, TikTok and a lot of these, like we should acknowledge that we're fighting in their field. When we're, work, when we're doing social mm -hmm. media work, this is their field. So immediate, I mean, it's not like we're gonna win there, but banning these platforms meaning we lost. So in a way, um, we have to acknowledge that we're not going to succeed as anyone who's extremely racist there because this platform gives them more um, visibility, but we can work smart. So uh, we have people that uh, we're not doing organizations TikToks, we're doing more around people like a person because it's stronger. And then he can or she can say something very provocative at the first sentence of the video and then say something exactly opposite or explain why this sentence is so horrible. But the, the beginning of the TikTok would be a very, very provocative saying. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So in, it's, it's a very weird way of working in these social media platforms, uh, but we really see how it affects especially young people uh, to understand more complex ideas um, so, yeah, that's my tip. <laughs> yes, so thank you very much, because it's, you're completely right. That's a, that's a field that is not for Democrats, right? So we have this invective and this respectful humor. Humor is here crucial to understand how the far right operate. You have also a kind of postmodern logic, which mm -hmm. invalidate any critique. And just to give you an example, you know that best that I, <laughs> I know. The, the video of Giorgia Meloni, which was a speech, saying a very important speech, I'm Georgia, I'm a mother, and so on, I'm a woman, I'm a mother, was remixed in the music by a left-wing um, activist and was reincorporated in the far-right narrative, so becoming a tool for the far-right narrative. So that's something that can always happen, So and, it, and you can try to, try to reappropriate again, and it will never mm -hmm. end. I, I thought um, your solution now to being provocative and after that giving a kind of contradiction to it, very interesting, because you can practice a kind of self-deconstruction. 
the, the audience today is very smart. They know how things are constructed. So playing with this knowledge could be a tool to affect them eff effectively. And it's also a source of pleasure, right? So you are use, you're connecting to social media because of pleasure, because of uh, enjoyment. If you give the audience the way to intellectually come behind the scenes, which you are always doing, and then to use that to deconstruct your, your first statement. That could be something that can be very effective, but it's not enough. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm still pessimist, mm. because the far right can do that as well. So, yeah, not, not very positive, but again, it's... it's it is as it, it is. It is something, yeah. Would you like to add? Mm. <coughs> I'll just say that um, I think it's... Obviously, you know, TikTok and so on are you know, relatively new, but I think the basic political problem actually isn't. Like, there have always been forms of popular media that lent themselves to reactionary politics, even if we think of things in, like, 19th century kind of music hall or, like, the uh, birth of cinema or, like, the kind of popular press in Britain, like tabloids and so on. There have always been ways to communicate information that were inherently demagogic, simplistic, which lent themselves to right-wing narratives, to skepticism about the public realm and democracy, and so on. And the history of democratic movements, most from democratic movements of the left, has been precisely the attempt to overcome that, mm -hmm. to instill in people a critical consciousness, a way of understanding the world, which allowed them to uh, you know, take you know, bite-sized bits of information, but have a critical attitude towards them. That's very difficult. You can't do it in as few characters, but I think it's necessary to having a democratic public realm because people have to be able to think for themselves and not just, you know, be followers of leaders and, with, and fans. Uh, in the Italian left, I think actually, you know, I, I don't want to dismiss the importance of having some presence on TikTok and so on, um, in the anti-war movement in Britain against the war in Gaza at the moment. You know, there's been some really good clips that have been released that have had massive circulation. But, you know, in the Italian case, we have these influencers, some of you might have heard of Ferranez, um, who, you know, they're kind of these, like, celebrity progressives and who've ended up in sort of various scandals and it's uh, blown back very badly against the political parties who are associated with them. So I think there's a, a, a certain risk as well of kind of chasing after easy uh, popularity in, in that sense. Of course, I don't mean uh, at all to suggest that that's the case with the, the, the person who asked the question. Uh, but yeah, I think it, it's a difficult terrain mm. which we can use somewhat. But then overall, I think that, that there are other ways of, of creating in people a kind of more critical consciousness and a more democratic uh, debate. I think I saw another question over there first. Yes, there. Hello. Can you hear me? My name is yes. Kevin Paida. Thank you very much. I have to try, to, I try to do something with my English, but please excuse me, it is not so um, good. Uh, I was born in Iran, and I have to say that uh, the populist uh, regime and the right wing and the uh, propaganda of anti uh, Zionism or Israel in general um, doesn't work for me. So I really wanted to say, I always wanted to go to Israel. And when they put the Israeli flag on the ground in Tehran and people don't walk on it, I really feel happy about that. And I was uh, thinking about the idea of Western promises, maybe a little bit of humoristic title for the festival. So when we think about the Second World War and then this promised land of forgiving to Israel as like a solution in that time. And today we have another situation. I live in Austria for many years. And the idea of what is, this, uh, what is the attitude of the Austri Austrian government, for example, goes to Israel and shake hand with Netanyahu, you know, our prime minister, or one of those 11 countries who was not for a ceasefire. So how could we, my question would be, how could we bring these two extreme um, ideas together? 
how could we be not only pro Israel against Israel or whatever to bring them uh, again and uh, also a question maybe how would you like to be this Western promise today how would be looks like is it a solution from outside from this uh, conflict Israel uh, Palestine or should be solved from inside I don't know it was maybe very complicated thank you Shani I guess well, question. it's not really the, the topic, I think, of this, uh, but I will say that um, to me it's very obvious that uh, democracy is for all um, and all human beings in our region um, should have uh, human rights and civil rights. Um, minorities within my country and uh, my neighbors um, should have their own country and Palestinian, there should be a Palestinian country. Um, and I think it's very obvious that our camp is the one that is pushing for this future. Um, of course, the situation is very complicated, uh, but democracy is um, something we all should fight for. It's very, it's very clear to me that if there won't be uh, democracy for the more privileged people than democracy for the lower uh, social economic status or for minorities like the Palestinians in Israel, they will be the first one to be hurt by a judicial overhaul because the Supreme Court um, keeps their rights. And once the Supreme Court will be taken down, then minorities like LGBTQ community, like the uh, Palestinian minority would be the, one, the first ones to be hurt. Um, and I do believe that um, external pressure is very important um, from the US, from Europe. Um, but we are in a very, very complex situation. Um, I, I fought for democracy for a year now, and now most of my energy uh, is towards the fight to bring the hostages back to Israel. I think for many people in Israel that are from the far right, it would have been easier for them if I wouldn't fight to bring the hostages back because mm -hmm. it's easier to show me as a traitor, which is what they keep saying about the pro-democracy movement, right? We're, we're traitors, we're fighting against the, against the country um, and showing that uh, this is like, we're fighting for human rights, whoever they are, wherever they are, uh, for everybody. Um, is a more complex idea, but this is the truth. This is what we are. Um, and yeah, I, I don't give up on peace, and I really hope that the world will stand with us to create this better future for the region and not for, not just for us, but for the entire population. Thank you. We had a question over here. Thank you very much. I was intrigued uh, by the uh, finding by Paula Deer that uh, the left is missing a vision. And um, I think the, the extreme right also does not have a vision. Mm -hmm. uh, they rather nourish uh, illusions uh, that change can be prevented, that you can go back to whatever nice uh, past. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, in, it's, a, it's a, I think, a very valid uh, question. What is the positive vision? Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, this doomism of last generation and so on is not very helpful in this respect. Yeah? So um, I wonder whether we could identify some of these elements here. And uh, I'm thinking, for example, about sustainability. I mean, there's a lot happening now to make our lifestyle more sustainable. Uh, on the international level, we have the Sustainable Development Goals, and one basic principle there is no one should be left behind. So I think that principle is also very important on the local, national, whatever level. Yeah? Uh, so the social justice dimension is, uh, I mean, has to be uh, addressed. Uh, because the right wing has indeed an argument here that people are feeling like losers. Yeah? and maybe uh, that can be addressed. 
But otherwise, what we see, uh, this uh, reaction uh, to the right wing, these big manifestations in Germany, in Austria, and so on, uh, that shows that there is a very strong movement there, mm -hmm. which stands for our values, which stands for our democracy. And uh, in that sense, uh, this also st meaning, uh, means that they stand for a vision, which they are defending. Yeah? But maybe we have to make this vision more visible and uh, give it more substance uh, so that it becomes uh, a strong uh, a strong alternative uh, to these uh, right-wing illusions. Thank you. Should I? Okay. Please, yeah. Thank you very much for touching this point because there is a huge question of the imaginary we have here. So um, if you look at the policies and rhetorics of politics in, in the North, I'm not so talking about the Global South, but in the North, we'll have ears decades of there is no alternative to the way we are living. And if you look at the imaginary it mobilizes, blo it blocks the imaginary for the future because there is no alternative. Don't think about alternative. And my critic on the established parties goes exactly in this direction, that the, the, the possibilities that we could have are not being articulated by established parties. And that's something which is the base for um, the room um, the, the far right is occupying right now. Mm. So my, my critique here is to say, you have to open up the imagination, the reformulation of uh, promises, but also the ideas of which kind of politics you can do. And of course, you have to think in alternative terms, not only the way you have lived until now. And if you look at the COVID crisis, during the first phase of the pandemic, there are a lot of ideas circulating about, oh, maybe we can reformulate the way we are living. And they were repressed after all. Everybody is now flying everywhere, uh, consuming like uh, it was before. Um, we are trying to repress these problems and so on. And um, that's not only a problem of civil society, that's a problem also for lawmakers and for the executive. So that's the one critique. On the other hand, you have the far right promising. I'm not saying that the promise is accurate if it works, but anyway, they are formulating promises of a kind of returning to a past which used to be harmonious. And they are offering effective imaginations where you can feel um, a part of a community. And I guess the left need to rediscover how to create, or the left and all the democratic forces, how to create um, a community uh, which can and should be diverse, but again, not the sum of very different uh, groups, but these groups working together in the sense of create a democratic community. And, and I think now um, the established parties realize they, they need to do something on this, in this direction, there is a huge pressure, there is a great potential of uh, democratic um, attitudes within um, the people at the streets. You can see that in the mass demonstrations. But I don't see yet how the established party, parties are really on the same level responding for it. I mean, they are... You have politicians go into the demonstrations in Germany, but after that and say, oh, the problem of democracy is a problem of civil society, just do it. But they all have their own thing to do. They have a function in this democratic setting, not only civil society. So we need to have responses from, from the parties. And that's something which I think the pressure at the streets can, can cause. But again, um, I'm not seeing the responses until now. Yeah, exactly. We had the next question. The, no, you were first, right? You're standing right next. Is your question over or still there? <laughs> the, with the white T-shirt. So it's me. Yeah, yeah, it's you. OK, thank you. Um, <laughs> So there's two things that I want to say. Um, one is about like rediscovering st strategies or, or ideas. 
and I think um, in, instead of looking what what uh, right wing movements or right wing parties are doing, and instead of like I don't know, um, kind of reassessing or reowning um, national flags or or terms like Heimat, I think we should just look at what is already existing on the ground in terms of um, ideas and movements and organizations that were born out of like uh, left political ideas. I'm talking about social centers, I'm talking about uh, neighborhood uh, initiatives, neighborhood centers, uh, cultural initiatives, cultural centers, uh, youth centers, uh, all kinds of like activist work that is on the ground. It's happening right now, it's happening everywhere, and a lot of these structures need actual people that go there, that work there, that participate th there. They also need like money to, to be supported in their activities. And I think like it's with like talking a lot about like social media and like s s certain forms of, of digital activism, we often forget that there's a lot of stuff happening on the ground. And in, in instead of like liking, re-liking or, or other people like doom scrolling hours and hours per day, like mm -hmm. every one of us like can look at their phones. We know how many hours we spend on there on, on our phones. <laughs> Like investing that time or investing some money if we are not able to invest the times in the existing structures that are already there everywhere in Graz, in Berlin, in London, uh, in in Tel Aviv, wherever. So yeah, this is a bit. It's, it's not so much of a question, but more like a comment. Thank, Thank you, you for your statement. Um, so you said that, or some of you actually mentioned, I think, uh, that we need a left-wing populism. So let's talk about left-wing populism. <laughs> because I think um, most of the uh, left or social democrat parties use slogans like tax the rich or affordable housing for everyone, but it, like, so the questions are kind of why doesn't that work? Because I think it's very basic <laughs> things that should work. Uh, and what else could there be? What, what slogans could you use? What could you promise? Uh, w what are left-wing populist statements or things you can promise and that you can actually use for your, um, uh, well, political movements or whatever? Should I? Uh, can I, can I answer yeah, that? Everyone wants. Okay. Um, I will say that we might be good on campaigning when we need to be elected, but then throughout um, the, the, I mean, after campaigning, after elections, I feel like at least in Israel, the opposition is almost numb. <laughs> like we can't feel them, they're not fighting back. Um, we, we really feel like a camp with no leaders. Um, and to me, Left-wing populism means to be in every committee, in the Knesset, in our parliament, in uh, the media, and to, to, to fight back, to push back, to be bold, to be brave, um, to be sharp, and they're not. Um, they keep on saying these complex ideas that um, I see people who are not very political and people who are not um, I don't know, they don't read the, the entire story, they just read the headlines, they don't get. And we have to be, I, I mean, it's really, it's kind of, it's against our values, but I'm, I'm calling us to do it because this is what we should do right now, in my opinion, um, to be, um, yeah, to be more aggressive, um, even, I would say, uh, we can't keep on being so polite and so complex and so and to hold every um, uh, complexity uh, and not to say anything very sharp because we think about like uh, maybe I'll give an example from from Israel. So we have the ultra orthodox um, community um, who are of course in the coalition. Um, they don't have any women in their lists for the for the parliament. Uh, no women politicians in the ultra-Orthodox uh, parties. Uh, they don't go to the uh, IDF, to the army, even though in Israel it's um, mandatory, everybody has to go. 
um, but they, because they're ultra orthodox, get not to go. Um, so they're not paying the price. They're not risking their lives. Um, they're not risking their children's life. Um, and yet they're sitting in the coalition and they're making decisions over our lives, even though they're not risking their lives. They're not paying the same taxes. They're not. Um, so, of course, as a, a social Democrat, I know that this population, because of their religion, the way they live, um, they are more poor than us. The social economic status is way lower than us. And of course, I want to give them, their children, everything possible for them to get the best education and so on. But if they're not learning math and English in their education system, which they're not because they're learning only religion, uh, uh, values, whatever, then I'm going to fight against it. And I'm not going to give them money for education if their education is not uh, helping the Israeli economy. And I'm not going to let them decide over um, security and, and over fighting if their sons and daughters are not going to fight. So I know it's very, it's, it's very complex because, of course, I, wanna, I want them to have everything, um, all the rights that I have. But in this situation, I have to be more populist, more aggressive, and to push back against them because they're fighting against my rights as a as a woman, as a woman, and 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 against LGBTQ, of course. So I can't accept everyone and at the same time fight. It's just not working. We've tried for many years. It didn't work, and we're now at this point where Israel is going like downhill or we're going I mean it's really at this um yeah this crucial point and and this is why I feel like we have to try something else more aggressive even though it's very hard for us yeah um from the democratic research perspective I will say be careful with what you're doing because populism is has a very ambivalent relationship to democracy in a certain way, you always have a, an amount of populism circulating among all political actors. That's necessary to have mobilization in order to point out the, the problems of democracy. But if you overstretch that, we'll, have en we'll end up with polarization, with discrediting all the institutions, with discrediting political representation, so that the very basis of the democratic setting is lost. And that's the reason why populism is a matter of degree. If you have too much of it, you cannot continue in the democratic terms anymore. So that's okay. A little bit populism is okay, but if you overstretch, you will end up with a polarized society where you have no place to build a unity community anymore. I think it's very much related to the questions we've been talking about in terms of, of vision, and indeed Western promise. I think part of the reason why the far right is successful uh, and also why they're able to create a kind of confected nostalgia or tradition is because they claim to be fulfilling promises, expectations that already exist. Like if we say, you know, there is no alternative. You know, if we look at Milani's party or even if we look at the Front National in France, you know, they're saying that they are really the party of meritocracy. You know, Le Pen's party opposed Charles de Gaulle, opposed the liberals in the 70s, opposed the socialists in the 80s and 90s, but now it claims that it's standing up for the age of social harmony which all those parties ru ruled over. It's claiming that it will make hard work pay, that you can become a homeowner, all these kind of things. In Maloney's case, you know, tax cuts and so on. And you know, they are achieving some material benefit for part of the population. Yeah. So the kind of change the left wants to confront issues like climate change and so on necessarily has to go bigger, is necessarily broader, isn't just tinkering with the system. So I think the question rightly posed this idea, okay, so why does tax the rich not work? Sounds good. That sounds like it runs against the idea of there is no alternative. But I think the problem is, is if we've spent the last 30 or 40 years in which often it was social democrat parties, often it was in fact the left that spearheaded 
there is no alternative type ideas. In Italy, the Democrats were the party who probably did most to undermine uh, the job security and some of the welfare measures that had been created in the past. So a lot of people who maybe are you know, my age, I'm 35, you know, would they have seen the left achieve things in government? Would they have seen left-wing parties actually deliver promises, actually make things better, actually show that politics works mm. in a way that, as you rightly say, I think the kind of cynicism of populism kind of works against. So I think, you know, to take a uh, finish on this, I mean, you know, in Britain, in the Labour Party in the last uh, few years, um, we had, you know, the Green New Deal, this idea of, yeah, like, we need the green transition, but we also need to create jobs. Mm. And that sounds nice. That's a good, like, marketing strategy for the green transition, right? Couple it to giving people job opportunities. But if people haven't seen the evidence that that works, if in their local area they can't see, you know, local councils already achieving that, if they can't see the process where it's really happening, then I think it's very hard to overcome people's, like, cynicism and doubt that, the, that this isn't just another way of you know, ruining their lives, of putting more taxes on them, on you know, lo shoulder, um, loading the costs of the green transition on their shoulders. Um, so I, I think the, the problem is to find evidence of uh, sort of concrete utopia, to yeah. find evidence that it's, the change is actually achievable and to, and to build on that. I think the vision has to be rooted in, in like real experience to, to show people that we're not just coming up with nice ideas or a sort of left-wing version of big promises, uh, but the, the collective action, the solidarity, the uh, po political participation is, is actually bringing people material gains. And some of the parties I mentioned earlier, like in Spain, where they massively increased the minimum wage, even in the Italian case, the uh, introduction of a basic income, you know, those did make some difference to the ele electoral patterns as well. So I think those are uh, very limited, but are examples to, to draw on. Can I add one sentence, just very shortly? <laughs> we are already running late, so thank you it so much for this. Okay, half sentence. <laughs> it will be just short. I just want to say that for us, it was very helpful to, to have like Zoom and webinars with people from the protest in Poland and to show people not only what we're fighting for, but what we're fighting against and how bad it can be. Um, and I think this also helps um, to, to, to get people to see the global fight and not only their own fight. Thank you so much. Thank you for this interesting panel. I still feel hopeful. I hope you do too. Thanks, Shani, for joining, <laughs> joining us online. Thank you. And at 6.30, there is a movie, a documentary, Breaking Social, followed by a Q&I by Frederick Gerton. I hope you join. Und ein bisschen später an dieser Stelle nochmal Dank an dieses Panel, Danke an vor allem die Menschen hier in diesem Saal, die uns drei Tage das Diskursprogramm so wunderbar gestaltet haben. Allen voran Sebastian, Olena, viele, viele andere, Stasi, vielen, vielen Dank. Ohne euch geht das hier gar nicht und natürlich möchte ich vor allem Florian Pirker, mit dem ich gemeinsam mit Elevit Gründer Bernhard Steirer, ich, Irina Nalis, dieses Diskursprogramm erstellen durften. Danke nochmal an Nina Schnieder, die auch jetzt gleich noch den heranfolgenden Film im Anschluss des Q&A moderieren wird. Aber an der Stelle vor allem vielen Dank für euch. Ja. Ja.